everyone and welcome to another episode of Everyday Black History. Now today on Everyday Black History, we're going to be highlighting a woman by the name of Annie Easley. And Annie Easley, whether you know it or not, is also one of the hidden figures. You see, there are a lot of there were a lot of hidden figures throughout history. There was the movie that came out that highlighted a few of them, but there were so many, you know, black women who helped and you know NASA space launches their their minds the mat the mathematics that that they did they were better than computers it was their minds that sent you know rockets to space that you know knew how long it was going to take um, in, in orbit or how long it was going to take to get to this uh, satellite or that space or that space station because you know as they say nowadays the technology we have now in our phones are more advanced than the, what they use to uh, send spaceships in the moon and it was people like Annie Easley who helped uh, with this type of math now she uh, was an african-american uh, computer scientist a mathematician and a rocket scientist she worked for the Lewis Research Center um, uh, of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration NASA and its predecessor the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics she was a leading member of a team which developed software for the Centaur rocket stage and was one of the first African Americans to work as a computer scientist at NASA. Now she was born uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, as we know, uh, during the time of segregation, you know, education was very limited to African Americans, and uh, you know, African American children were taught in different schools for, from white children. But uh, Annie Easy was fortunate in that her mother, her mother instilled in her the um, the, the the courage um, to, to 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 do her best in everything that she tried. Uh, she told her that she can do anything that she wanted, but that she would have to work at it. And she encouraged her to get a good education. And from the fifth grade through high school, she attended um, Holy Family High School, and she was the valedic valedictorian of her graduating class. After high school, she went to Xavier University in New Orleans, uh, which was then uh, an African-American Roman Catholic University, and there she majored in pharmacy for about two years. Um, after that, she returned to B uh, Birmingham in the 1950s, and as part of the Jim Crow laws that established, that were established at the time, African-Americans were required to pass an, uh, an uh, literacy test and to pay a poll tax in order to vote. And uh, she uh, told a story how she remembers the test giver looking at her application and saying only, you went to Xavier University, $2, as if to say, yeah, whatever, you know, you got a college education. But uh, she was able to help others, um, other African Americans, to prepare for that test and pass the test because she was educated. Um, in the 1960s, race to uh, segregation um, uh, of Birmingham's downtown residents, or, or merchants rather, uh, ended as a result of the Birmingham campaign. In 1964, um, the 24th Amendment outlawed the poll tax in federal elections. Um, and it was not until the Voting Rights Act in 1965 that the literacy test was um, eliminated. So uh, because of all this racism and all this hardship, she moved to Cleveland and um, continued to, uh, with the intention to continue her studies but unfortunately, the local university that had ended its pharmacy program um, uh, a short time before she arrived, and she had uh, no other alternative. Um, so in 19, so after that, you know, she read a local newspaper uh, article about a story on uh, twin sisters who worked for uh, NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, um, which was the predecessor to NASA. And they worked as computers. Uh, they, they, they said that these two young twin sisters were like computers because they they were good at mathematics. So she applied for a job and was hired two weeks later. And she was one of four African Americans of about 2,500 employees that worked at NACA at the time. She began her career as a mathematician and a computer engineer at the NACA Lewis Flight Propulsion Laboratory, which became uh, NASA later on. And, and um and also at the John H. Glenn Research Center in, in Cleveland, Ohio. 
She continued her she continued her education while she was working there, and in 1977 she obtained a bachelor's of science in mathematics from Cleveland State University. As part of a of a continuing education, she worked through uh, specialization courses that were offered that were offered through uh, NASA. Now she worked there for 34 years, and throughout her 34 year career, it included developing and implementing computer code that analyzed alternative power technologies. She supported the the Centaur high energy upper rocket stage, determined solar, wind, and energy projects, identified energy conversion systems and alternate systems to solve energy problems, um, as well as other things. Many, many other projects she was involved in. Her energy assignments included studies to determine the life uh, use of storage batteries, such as those that were used in the electric uh, utility vehicles out there in space. And her computer applications have helped, um, have been used to identify energy conversion systems that offer the improvement over commercially available technologies. Uh, she retired uh, from NASA in uh, 1989 or 1981, depending on where your sources are from. Um, but as mentioned, you know, she worked with the Centaur project, uh, this with the space program, um, and helped as a technological. Her work with that project helped as technological foundations for the space shuttle launches and launches of communication, military and weather satellites um, became more more uh, more complicated. It was her um, it was her her work that helped to uh, make that easier to understand. Um, her work contributed to the 1997 flight to Saturn of the uh, Cassini probe, the launcher of which had the Centaur as its upper stage. Um, she was interviewed um, in 2001 by Sandra Johnson, and um, that interview is stored at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Johnson Space Center Oral History Program. <laughs> That's a lot to say. And the interview includes a material on the history of the Civil Rights Movement, the Glenn Research Center, the Johnson Space Center, spaceflight, and the contribution of women to spaceflight. And she's also always been an advocate for and encouraged female and minority students at college to work in the STEM uh, field, um, as many uh, African-American women in the field uh, do, because there's not a lot of us in those fields. But uh, Amy Easley, uh, Amy, uh, yeah, Easley has uh, definitely contributed much to black history and black culture through her work. Um, you know, being a pioneer in, in NASA and being a first is never easy, you know, but be, her being a pioneer in NASA uh, through her work, you know, she's one of the forgotten hi hidden figures. And so we wanted to highlight her here on Everyday Black History. There are other, uh, there's much more information on her, um, some of her work that she's contributed to as far as papers that she's um, contributed to writing. Um, and there's just, there's more information on her. So I encourage, you know, all, you all to take the time and uh, look up Amy Easley because, as we mentioned, she is one of the hidden figures, um, the forgotten hi hidden figures throughout history. So that concludes this episode of Everyday Black History. Uh, please continue to tune in. Um, the podcast Everyday Black History is uh, on Spotify and iTunes and, and Google, or wherever else you find podcasts. We're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, uh, on Facebook. Just look up, type in Everyday Black History and you'll find us. So thanks for the support. Stay tuned for the next episode.